Good afternoon, everyone. I will call this meeting to order and please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. It's now time for public comments. Mr. Doyle, I believe we have two. Yes, sir. Our first speaker, Mr. Chair, and I might need to ask how much time we can allot. Let's do three minutes. Our first speaker is Monica Delancey. And Ms. Delancey will speak about associations, involvement in schools and community. Hello, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Um, particularly, I'm speaking about associations that um, recruit um, members from your teacher personnel, your bus drivers, your parapros, whoever they can get to join their association. Um, they do an active and a, and a progressive and aggressive recruitment and is well known in Cobb County um, schools. With that, they do host um, monthly meetings. And most recently, about a month ago, um, this meeting was held, and the president said at her discretion, she can decide who attends the meetings and, um, and that sort of thing. But also at the meetings, um, they took time out to um, discuss endorsements of candidates at this meeting. And in the discussion, um, it came about, um, they said who the state was going to endorse, their state associates were going to endorse, as well as their local, who they're going to endorse. And members asked, you know, how did you come about with these um, endorsements? You know, did you use a survey? Was there a questionnaire? And we were told that the president can decide on if she wanted to release um, the questionnaire or, and or the surveys. And I was just saying that as a member that um, people would like to see how, you know, the other candidates answer is, instead of you just coming and saying it's at your discretion. And so also after the meeting, it was requested for the um, president to provide the bylaws for the association. And also was requested um, to the state level as well. The bylaws have not been forwarded. Um, but I know this association takes out um, about $30 a month for some members up to $60 a month. That could be anywhere from $500 to $800 a year. And some of those fees are used to um, donate to, you know, campaigns. And with that being said, I think that the association should allow for uh, members to see the surveys or questionnaires that were used. So that's what I want to say at this time, and um, thank you for allowing for me to share. Thank you. Our final speaker, Mr. Chairman, is Leah Ash, who will discuss the Kennesaw Charter Science and Math Academy. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Um, I had a, a nice conversation this morning with Dr. Katula um, about my concerns. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I'm in the Ford Harrison Durham district, which is a wonderful district with Mr. Wheeler. And um, the one challenge that we have seen in public schools or that we have faced with having three sons who all have various degrees of disabilities is that we have struggled with getting um, their disabilities addressed within the public school system. And for us at the elementary school level, our alternative has been Kennesaw Charter. Um, which for um, my older son, who's now in seventh grade, was phenomenal. Um, their occupational therapists, speech therapists, the teachers, the flexibilities of the administration were beyond compare. The teachers had a lot more leeway to do what to provide what the child needed in order to be successful. And it was a wonderful experience. Um, I had no hesitation in having my twins uh, start there. Um, for kindergarten uh, three years ago. Um, and kindergarten and first grade, again, absolutely phenomenal. Um, this year, about two months ago, one month into the school year, um, our wonderful principal, new principal, Dr. McNeely, was forced out. 
um, a new administrative or executive director was hired, and then she went and single-handedly hired a new principal. Um, this was not taken up by the board. It wasn't discussed with parents. It was done in two single motions, um, and they have essentially destroyed our school. Um, we have had an absolute exodus of teachers and staff from the school. Um, by my count, it's close to 20 to 25 staff members who have either quit or been fired in the last um, two months. Um, I believe with the twins, that brings a total up to about 45 students who have left the school in the last two months. Um, absolutely no effort is being made to prevent any of us from leaving. The executive director I have on film saying, let them go. If they don't wanna be here, let them go. Obviously, this is not the right attitude that we need to have. Um, I live streamed two um, board meetings as well as a town hall meeting um, in order to try to show to the rest of the community the challenges there. 30 seconds. And, um, but unfortunately, the board that's currently in place at the school is under uh, Ms. Odesulu is completely unwilling to listen to parent complaints or concerns. Um, and as a result, the school is going to collapse. Um, and it's a real shame. And I feel like someone needs to know that it's happening because we're gonna have hundreds of students without a school soon. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Ms. Ash. Uh, next, we have the approval of the minutes from the October 18th board meeting. There are no objections to the approval. They are approved. And we're ready to get on with board business and hear that. Mr. Ragsdale, you want to bring the Development Authority of Cobb County? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Superintendent, members of the board. We appreciate the opportunity to once again come before you to tell you some things that are being done in Cobb County. Uh, we're going to uh, turn over in just a second uh, a presentation of a new building that is that is to be built in the Kennesaw area to uh, service a, a shortfall of needed space up in that area. And it's our pleasure to bring that to you. I'm going to let Mr. Jeter tell you a little bit more about it and then We'll let Mr. Egan introduce his associate, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions y'all might have. Good afternoon, and once again, thank you for allowing us to uh, present to you another very exciting project in the northern part of our county. But before I do that, uh, just want to let you know that uh, as a result of the uh, collaborative effort between the Development Authority of Cobb County and the uh, Cobb County School District, uh, we're going to create uh, basically roughly 3,100 new jobs in the county this year with an average salary of about $90,000. The project that I'd like to share with you uh, is called Edison at Chastain Meadows. As Mr. Hungerford mentioned, it's a $35 million investment uh, that will build 150,000 square foot office space. Uh, that will bring uh, roughly 525 uh, new employees. Uh, the facility is located uh, almost adjacent to the uh, building that we did about five years ago, the Home Depot uh, call center, where we put about 1,000 new employees up in that area. Mr. Andrew Egan of Kutak Rock is representing the client. So at this time, I'd like to call him up to introduce the client and the project. Well, thank you all for having us. Um, again, Andrew Egan, um, good afternoon, everybody. Matt Prince is here with me from TPA Group, which is the entity behind um, the applicant to the authority, the proposed developer of the site. And as uh, Mr. Hungerford and Mr. Jeter mentioned, um, it's a currently approximately 30-acre undeveloped site, Chastain Meadows Parkway near Bells Ferry. And it's a Class A office building that's proposed that um, I think will meet a need uh, up there for um, facility of this type. There's not been any type of investment like this in over a decade. Um, so we're excited about it, and I think it'll be a positive benefit 
um, to the county, to in particular to that area of the county for commuters in particular, so businesses can stay um, in that northwest portion of the county. Um, we've got some materials, um, schematics, if that would be helpful for anyone to see. Um, and if there's sort of anything that you'd like us to, to speak to specifically to the project, um, Matt, I know would be um, willing and able to do that and happy to entertain any questions you guys might have as well, of course. Mr. Scamhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for being here and presenting to us. Just real quick and, and I've glanced, uh, read through your information once, but I didn't pick it up. It may be there. <clears throat> How long before you're fully staffed? What year, month are you projecting to be open and then fully staffed? Good question. I think the idea would be to begin construction as soon as the site's acquired. I think the idea would be to have construction completed sometime in the first part of 2020. That's correct, and we would envision uh, the project is being built on a speculative basis without any identified tenants at this time to meet the, the unmet need in this part of the county. We would envision it would take approximately 12 to 18 months upon delivery completion of construction uh, to achieve the, the full employment and occupancy load in the building. So around 2020, uh, 2022, that's going to be a mouthful. 2021 to 22, 22 okay. yes, sir. And the reason why I asked was... Uh, so that we can start planning, because that's going to be potentially quite an influx of students once you have all those people uh, to come on board. And then uh, I assume that, uh, well, they all won't live around there, but uh, uh, like Sprayberry or Kell, maybe uh, Lassiter and Walton would be uh, schools most uh, affected. So it gives us about four years to to see it, how that's going to develop. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for <clears throat> for bringing this project to the board and informing us as to what our future looks like in that area. And I want to thank Mr. Hungerford for his committee that uh, puts all this together and brings each individual project to the board for our evaluations and our knowledge of, of what's coming. I got a couple of questions. Uh, one is, has the county approved the uh, project? I wanna make sure I answer your question correctly. When you say approve the project and the county approve it, are, are you talking about from a, like a zoning or entitlement process? Z yeah, zoning, you know, have they zoned, given you zoning approval? Good, good question. The final site plan approval is scheduled for November 20th. That's correct. We have an approved site plan that was approved in May. We've asked for some modifications to that site plan um, <coughs> that are going before the commission on the next Tuesday, okay. the 20th. So do you have the blessing of the planning committee? We we do. We have the, the, the blessing of staff, and we're working with the district commissioner and uh, interested civic associations to address okay. their comments on our modified site plan that are some small changes from what was previously approved in May. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you presented us with uh, two financial statements. Uh, could you explain what those mean uh, and you know how it affects the school system? Sure. Um, yep. Yeah. On all projects, uh, Mr. Banks, where there's potential uh, tax savings, uh, we run a fiscal impact analysis. We do an independent uh, study with Georgia Tech Innovation Center, uh, which you have before you. Uh, they look at all of the new revenue that's generated as a result of the project, uh, subtract out all the costs associated with the project, and come up with a net uh, present value. As you'll see by this study, for the county, it's showing a, a positive of roughly $621,000. Uh, for the school system, it's showing a negative of about $293,000. Uh, basically, as I indicated before, uh, we take a very conservative approach uh, to doing these analyses. Uh, if you look over in year eight and nine, you'll see that the property taxes began to de de decline 
and it declined because of the fact that they began to depreciate uh, the real property, buildings only, based on IRS standards. But if you look at the appreciation rate of commercial property within the county, it's been going up by about 8 to 10 percent per year. So we feel very confident that even though the study is showing a negative fiscal impact analysis, uh, net present value, that with the escalation rates of property in that area, if it continues at the same rate, that that would more than offset uh, that negative figure. I, I guess the, the, my bottom line is, does the school system lose any money on, as, as uh, far as this project's concerned? Uh, no, because within the uh, memorandum of understanding, uh, we're also requiring that the school system will pay, that the school system will be paid pilot payments in lieu of taxes during the construction phase and also during the first year of the uh, abatement. So that will be negative erosion uh, to the school system. To give an example, if the property uh, undeveloped is on the books at $30 million, for example, uh, that doesn't go away. Uh, that still uh, come to you in the form of a pilot uh, payment. Then the first year of the abatement is at zero, we, you still collect that. Then the second year of the abatement at 10%, considering the investment in the land and the investment in the new property, it should far exceed what you're currently getting on the property. Okay, so in the long run, we actually come out ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Franks. Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, the, you know, the one the one thing I, I continue continually bring up is the importance of improving or increasing the commercial digest in our county, which puts less of a burden on our school system and yet uh, remits uh, higher taxes, which is going to help the school district out. And I think uh, you know it's helpful for the board to consider uh, looking at these is really the long-term impact uh, of these types of projects. Um, and very simply, let's say you know in a, in a particular development that you have an opportunity to either develop with or without the abatement. With the abatement, you're likely to build something that is going to be, let's say, have greater square footage, <coughs> um, and and so forth. And so over a let's say a 20 year, a 30 year, a 50 year period, the, the dollars that would be remitted to the school district over the long term would be substantially greater than if the property was developed without the abatement. So it's something to consider going forward. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Anyone else? Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate you coming you. in and sharing with us. Um, as we move forward, it's now time for the Facilities and Technology Committee. Mr. Scamahorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the committee met on Tuesday, October 30th, 2018. Uh, due to a lack of, of a quorum, the committee could not vote to approve meeting minutes or review, review previously board approved projects. Uh, the committee will revise and review the F&T annual report, and the annual report will be submitted to the board in January. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on that? Okay, we're ready now for the superintendent's report. Mr. Ragsdale. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. John Adams to come forward and, and bring a uh, bus safety update. Uh, as you will remember, um, this is going to encompass, uh, again, the the contractual um, situation and, and arrangement we have um, for the, the stop arm cameras. Um, and as you may have already heard or read, uh, the, the county commissioners also uh, re-approved that as well. So John, if you will. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, you uh, all up. are familiar with our stop arm camera program? Yeah, come up to the oh. podium. It's only been a month since we've had a meeting. Yeah. You're all familiar with our stop arm uh, camera program, but just by way of review, it was initially uh, created in the state legislature. Representative Don Parsons from East Cobb created it. Uh, our solicitor, Barry Morgan, uh, was very instrumental in that, and they both remain instrumental in that. Uh, the district has been a national leader and award winner 
for our pioneering work in this and our stop arm program remains a model for other districts that they follow and uh, we receive numerous calls frequently from districts around the country asking for our advice on how to set up a similar agreement. It was initially set up for five years, uh, starting in the 2012 year, and then you may recall we did, uh, for lack of a better term, an interim agreement for one year uh, during uh, for the 2018 year. That's going to expire at the end of this year. Uh, as you may recall, there were some uh, concerns expressed by the Cobb County State Court personnel about and I won't begin to try to explain uh, the legalese behind the whole notification and process issue, uh, but there were some legal concerns there. Uh, and then uh, July 1st, the law was changed. Uh, so the definition of what is a violation was changed. So as a result, uh, or in light of both of those occurrences, we have now worked with, uh, it was originally a three-party agreement, now it would be a four-party agreement, including the state courts, the county commissioners, uh, ATS, which is the company uh, that processes the back end, the back house uh, uh, processing of these violations, and the school district, now a four-party agreement, uh, and we're ready to present to the, to the chair uh, and the superintendent a signature of a five-year renewal, which uh, is based on the revised law and which also has addressed the concerns of the state court so that all four parties now uh, are in agreement and can uh, continue this important program for five more years uh, and have a continued outstanding partnership. Our goal, of course, is zero violations. Uh, I would love to get to that one day. I can't tell you that we're at zero violations. We have seen a reduction in violations as a result of the program. Uh, uh, we are not uh, obviously completely enamored with the change in the definition of what is a violation that occurred on uh, July 1st. Uh, and we are working with our legislators to address that uh, as soon as possible. But we think this new agreement will help us keep students safe uh, and hopefully get violations to the point now where uh, eventually where we won't have to even have an agreement, but we're not there. So we need this for five more years. The commissioners approved it at their meeting earlier this week. The clerk of courts uh, has already signed it. So subsequent to this meeting, we'll present it to the superintendent and the chair. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Do you have any statistics uh, on uh, how many violations we've had since the beginning of this year? Uh, and also, how is the revenue shared? Uh, we have some. It, uh, the last report that I heard was that so far uh, there have been since since the law changed, which is, is relevant because it changed the definition of what would be a potential violation. Let me define a few terms. We have, we have incidents, which are if there may have been a violation and it's captured on the school bus cameras, and then those uh, are processed and not every incident results eventually in a citation but uh, in the broadest sense, uh, the last information I heard were, was that there were 17,000 uh, since the change in the law. Now, not all of those would be violations or necessarily citations, but potential incidents. Um, we're still in a bit of a state of flux since uh, we are perfecting how to process this and uh, since the change in the law. But, uh, that's an approximate figure, but about 17,000 since July 1st. As far as the revenue sharing, uh, under the new uh, arrangement, we're proposing uh, the state court uh, has created five new positions to help them process and prosecute, if need be, these violations. By agreement of all the parties, the cost of that essentially would come off the top. Uh, that uh, is uh, $30,000 for those, all those positions together. Uh, each month that comes off the top and then uh, after that the remaining revenue from the collected violations is split 34 percent for ATS and then 33 percent uh, for the commissioners and 33 percent for the school district the school the school system gets how what percentage 33 percent 33 okay all right thank you mr. chairman thank you mr. banks anyone else 
I, I just want to reiterate, to John said this uh, at, the, at the start of the presentation, but I want to reiterate that we highly anticipate um, a correction to the legislation uh, in this next session uh, because, uh, it, just my opinion, but, but I believe that damage was done to the by the modifications uh, made to the legislation. And what I'm referring to is where it changed um, how a five lane divided highway with no median was treated. Because as you know, originally, uh, and that the good example of that is Powder Springs Road, right? Where there's a turning lane and then two lanes in both directions. Um, what changed to the law allowed traffic approaching a stopped school bus in, on Powder Springs Road to continue in motion um, with the changes in the legislation. Originally, originally, all traffic had to stop regardless if there was no median. Um, I, I think it, um, for whatever reason, uh, those modifications were made. Uh, and, and thankfully for us, um, Rick Grisham and Transportation Department does an, an outstanding job of designing uh, the bus routes such that pickups and exits of students do not cross divided highways. And as much as we possibly can, they're designed such that they're always on the right. But then when you get into subdivisions, which is some of the, the, the most concerning and quite honestly scary videos that you will see, or within subdivisions where cars just blow by a stopped bus. Um, and, and that's probably the most dangerous situation that we have. Um, that being said though, there are certainly other school districts and, and other um, highways to where the change in this legislation definitely puts students at increased risk because of uh, the way that uh, traffic does not have to stop. So again, we, we highly anticipate a correction being made to this legislation within the next session. Um, we're we're going to certainly bring that up um, as, as a top priority um, of discussion uh, as the session starts. So I just wanted everybody to be, um, you know, cognizant of, of that change that has been made, but hopefully we'll be able to get that corrected. Thank you, Mr. Ragsdale. Mr. Sweeney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, John, you may or may not know the answer to this question. Um, with regard to, uh, it's my understanding now that um, the Cobb Public uh, um, Safety Officers, they have an opportunity to uh, write citations in school zones, is that correct? Uh, if you're referring to the school district's police officers, no, we were actually pushing for that change, but our school district police department does not yet have the ability to do that. The, okay. the Cobb County Police Department does, but our school district does not yet. We, we think that we need that. Okay, I, I thought we were pushing for that. I was I just wanted to thank you very much. I've got a question, Mr. Adams. Yes. Along those lines, kind of similar but not. Do all, our officers have, can, can they write obviously traffic tickets in there for parking, but what do they, in, in a nutshell, what all, kind of things do they have our school district. What kind of officers? powers do they have with the automobile and uh, in in parking lots and on campuses? On school district property, they can enforce parking violations. Uh, obviously, anything involving student parking permits, uh, things like that. But when you leave uh, the school district property, uh, there are only certain uh, jurisdictions that are allowed to do tickets for for radar, for example, or, or speed enforcement. And there's certain permitting requirements. Uh, an odd anomaly in the current law, and this is to Mr. Sweeney's point that we were trying to address, is that the Kennesaw State University Police Department, for example, because of the current wording of the law, can run radar or laser and enforce uh, speeding uh, on their campus or on Chastain Road. Uh, school district police departments, which have this similar officer certification, just don't have the statutory ability in the way the law is currently written to do the same thing. That is what we were pushing for and which we will continue to push for. Let me add to that, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, all of our officers are post-certified. 
so they are a post-certified officer that can uh, engage when criminal activity is taking place and they're present, you know, for that. Okay, but as far as running radar, running laser um, uh, for speeding violations in a school zone, that is prohibited currently by the, the wording of the legislation. But they do have authority on campus to... Absolutely, yeah, yes. To, they they are post-certified officers that have... So in front of the school zone, they're, they're not, they can't do those things, but on campus they can. Yes. That was my point. Well, you still can't run radar in, in a school zone, even if it's well, within... I mean, I was yeah. talking about traffic things. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Adams. Okay, I guess we're ready to go to board agenda items, Mr. Ragsdale. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, agenda item number one is the uh, monthly recurring agenda item for disposable school district surplus uh, per district administrative rule DO-R. That uh, list has been sent electronically to the board. Be happy to answer any questions at this time you might have. Okay. Without objection, we'll go to consent. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, agenda Seven. number two, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. John Floresta to come forward and bring this. Mr. Scamhorn. I do have a, uh, a question about property disposal. It, uh, it's, it's indirect, but it's uh, related to it. Are we, uh, as we uh, surplus uh, PCs, whether laptops or, or uh, you know, desktops, do they get a one-for-one -one exchange, whoever? they may have like a school like they have a uh say a hundred uh desktops do they get a opportunity to choose and or do they get a one-for-one -one swap um let me clarify a little bit of differentiation in 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 that question so as far as the refresh goes um there is some autonomy that the schools have um, th that we have done this a little bit different because um, schools have um, supplemented what the what the central office provides for desktops, PCs, etc. Et um, a lot of schools have supplemented to that. Um, so what we have done uh, is basically provide each school with a budget allotment of SPLOS funds for um, obsolete computing device replacement. Um, so they are able to basically pick and choose, if you will, from a list that we provide. So it's not like you can go down to Best Buy and buy whatever you want to with SPLOS dollars. Um, we have a bid list, um, and we have identified those items that are eligible for a school um, to choose from, whether it be laptop carts or desktops, um, uh, tablets, those kind of things that, that are approved. So it's not necessarily a one-for-one. Um, because again, if a school has chosen to supplement their inventory with a, uh, whether it be, um, you know, PTA funds or school foundation funds, those kind of things, um, they can use their budgetary allotment of SPLOS funds as they see fit on approved items, but it may not be one for one. Now, on this list, these. These items are just uh, items that have been surplus for whatever reason. It could be that they're out of warranty and have been refreshed, uh, but it also could be that they're they're broken beyond repair, um, repair kind of thing. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, it it thoroughly answers the question. But I wonder if uh, do we have checks and balances to make sure that they're wisely choosing? I guess like. You know, like if they had 30 desktops and they only wind up with 20 um, Macs, you know, that's that's going in the wrong direction or something. I don't know. Yeah, right. So the short answer to that question is yes. Um, we have all of technology services, um, specifically field services, the field techs there, and also running up the chain um, uh, from the, uh, the TTISs, et cetera, within technology services to advise a school on best practices and, and make recommendations uh, for them to choose from because again you, we have to ensure that they maintain um, lab functionality for example um, and then any kind of over and above that recommendation would certainly be there let me also go back and clarify one point too um, that is a one for one refresh and that is in regards to uh, teacher laptops 
when we do the refresh for teacher laptops, we actually handle that from technology services. So they go out and refresh every single teacher laptop with the same model, et cetera. So that is not contained within that autonomy or that budgetary allotment for schools. Okay. That's handled from within technology services. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Scammerhorn. Mr. Banks, you had a question? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> over the years, uh, our PTAs and our foundations have bought a lot of uh, laptops, uh, notebooks, so forth, and carts. Are they included in this refreshment or disposal, or are they totally outside of it? Yeah, so again, that, that's what I was saying, um, that each school uh, has been provided a budgetary allotment of SPLOS funds. So the short answer to that question is no. Um, we would not replace, refresh a system that was purchased outside of what we have provided. And that's why we have gone to this different uh, methodology, if you will, instead of trying to go out and do a walkthrough of each school and, and figure out, okay, how much is it going to be necessary to re replace and refresh because those kind of things have to be taken into consideration because if we're, if we're going to have, if we have two elementary schools at different parts of the county, one of those elementary schools has a foundation or PTA funds that they have used to supplement the number of computing devices within that school. The other school does not. You may have, and I'm just making these numbers up, you may have 300 computer, computing devices at one school and 150 at the other. Going in and replacing on a one-for-one -one basis is simply not fair and equitable um, as far as the school is concerned and as far as the utilization of SPLOS funds are concerned. So that kind of got us to the point of developing a process based on FTE of uh, exactly how much SPLOS monies would be allotted per school based on FTE to allow that school to pick and choose from laptops, desktops, tablets, et cetera. Um, so instead of saying, okay, you can, uh, um, you've got 200 um, desktops, you've got 150 laptops and 25 tablets, um, that's going to cost X number of dollars. We say, okay, here's your allotment based on FTE, uh, and that makes it more equitable from a SPLOS funding perspective. We're not saying to schools, look, it, it's not right for you to be able to have more than another school does. That's totally up to the school. Now, we do require that if they're going to purchase additional units, that it be off the bid list again, um, because we have to maintain a level of functionality and support um, from technology services, so we can't have schools just going out and willy-nilly buying, um, you know, whatever the latest fad is for technology, for example. So, so we do still maintain um, parameters and requirements on the funding, but it's more based on us providing the SPLOS dollars as a budgetary allotment based on FTE to each school so that they can choose um, to do with that as, as best fits their school. Okay, let me see if I can understand this correctly. Let's take a school, like you say, it's got 50 carts, 30, 30 PCs or technology units per cart. Uh, so, we're what you're. If I understand correctly, what you're saying is some of those were. Well, let's say they were, all, they were all purchased by the PTA or the foundation. No, no school funds were actually used. Now, some of the school funds can replace some of those units with school funds. Is that correct? Except for school funds, it's SPLOS dollars. Well, SPLOS dollars. Yeah, so it's okay. not general fund um, okay. dollars allotted to each school. It's so, SPLOS dollars. So if they had, <clears throat> let's say, 20 carts and 10 of them were going to be replaced, then it would be up to the foundation and the PTA or whoever to replace those other 10 or, or if, if they need to be replaced or if they wanted to purchase more, it would be up to them to purchase, but they would have to be to our configurations. That's correct, yes. Okay. Now, I do want to clarify because one thing could could sound um, not very fair, um, and I do want to clarify that because what you were saying was is, is if you had 30 laptop carts and 20 of them were going to be ref refreshed, it'd be up to the school or the foundation or whatever to come up with the other 10. Um, only uh, that is basically if the foundation or PTA 
was responsible for those additional 10. Right. So the budgetary allotment that we're providing each school is based on FTE. And so that would normally cover, whether it be laptop or desktop refresh, for what was provided originally by the district. So it, it, I, I don't want it to seem like we're, we're shortchanging a school when we've provided those computing devices and we're not giving them enough money to refresh on a one-for-one -one basis what those are because that has been taken into consideration. But again, if a foundation PTA has gone above and beyond um, and supplemented uh, that inventory, then, then it's just up to the school to pick and choose and decide what is the most important priority to replace with the SPLOS dollars being provided. Okay, now that's a change for, for the way we processed it in the past. It, 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 it's a change, but it's not a new change. That's, that's been in place for years. Has it? Okay, yes. I wasn't aware of that. Because yeah. uh, I know a lot, you know, in some of my schools, there's been a lot of private purchases made right. over the years, and uh, some of those are going to have to be replaced. So now they have a way of doing it. The school has a way of doing it. Yes. So having, having to go back to the PTA and say, we need to replace 30 carts of, yes. of PCs. They only may need to replace 10. Exactly. Or whatever number, you know. The, the FT allotment allows. That's correct. Okay, I understand. Yep. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Banks. If there's no objection, that's going to stay on consent. Okay, 7-0. Number two. Board, Mr. Superintendent, it is my pleasure to bring to you agenda item number two, recommendation for approval of the Georgia Department of Education 21st Century Community Learning Center Grant Award. It is my pleasure to bring this agenda item to you in that most who stand before you at this podium are asking you for dollars. In this case, I am asking you for approval to accept dollars from the uh, U.S. Ed, specifically through the federal funds, I'm sorry, federal programs uh, department, specifically Title IV. Uh, in Cobb, we use 21st Century Grant Award for uh, after school activities at Campbell High School, Baker Elementary, Ackworth Elementary, Barber Middle School, and Riverside Primary. In each case, these funds, which are uh, currently uh, in operation in the district, um, are used for STEM diplomat program at Campbell, Campbell High School, Reach for the Stars at uh, Baker, Ackworth, and Barber, and Riverside Primary. Uh, uses these funds for a program called Building Bridges for Early Success. In each case, those programs uh, begin immediately after school and are focused on early literacy um, or STEM initiatives. Uh, the total dollar figure being recommended for your approval today is $756,341. Uh, Again, those funds are approved by the Georgia Department of Education and are awarded to the schools as noted. Uh, with that, the recommendation before you today is to approve those funds as is. I am available for any questions. Questions, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, these grants, do we, I'm sure when you applied for them, you had to have a goal in mind of what, what success is going to look like. Can you elaborate a little bit more about what we expect out of these funds? We do. So we actually, there's, there's two answers to that question. There's a baseline of expectations set for us by U.S. Ed. As you would imagine, if the if, uh, federal government's going to give us money, they've got a series of, of uh, questions behind that, and there's a yearly review cycle for these programs to make sure that the dollars are being used effectively for kids. We also have our own process, continual review of how these programs are proving to be effective inside a local school, both from an academic and social point of view. Can you care it a little bit further and how, it gonna, how, how will it affect the students? Sure. So we have a, uh, I'll take Campbell High School. So we have the STEM Diplomats program. So there is an after school program which is providing support specifically focused on STEM in a variety of fashions. I would take that parallel and, uh, or take that example and I could apply it to Baker, Barber, or Riverside as well. Um, in each case, the programs, the academic programs that are in place after school have specific focus areas and then are evaluated for those focus areas by us as staff. And again, ultimately, once a year by U.S. Ed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Mr. Scammerhorn. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you. Uh, 
Is this a renewal or a new grant? It is. Yes, this is a renewal. I should have mentioned that inside the item. We've received this grant for the last number of years. How long was the first? Uh, was it like a three-year grant, the first one, or five? It's a yearly renewal cycle, so we have to approve this. This item was before you last year as well. It will be in front of you again, I would anticipate, next year. Uh, okay. I do not know offhand how many years previous to this we've received the award. I know offhand it's been the last two years. So on an economic downturn or for any number of reasons, uh, if we lose the grant, then we lose the program or we? We do. Okay. That is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As, as well as any positions that were, that were created as a result of the grant. Uh, we've... We've had that in place for a number of years, but just wanted to reiterate that, that we do not, uh, when a grant loses funding, if they do for whatever reason, we do not choose to carry on those positions or the, or the program to okay. the general fund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Camhorn. Ms. Thayer? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Floresta. I just wanted to say that it's a standard reoccurring item, and I wanted to recommend that we put it on consent agenda. Without objection, consent. All right, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Adams to come and bring, um, I believe the next two items. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have quite as good news as Mr. Floresta, uh, but I do at least, the first one is free. The second one I will ask you for a little bit of money, but it's a good deal. Uh, agenda item number three, recommendation to approve an easement at South Cobb High School. As we do from time to time with Georgia Power, if we're undertaking major work at a school, we try to go in and uh, do some consolidation of electrical, uh, especially if we're doing some uh, work in, in some lighting replacements, LED replacements. So Georgia Power has asked uh, towards that end, for an easement at South Cobb High School so that we can consolidate with them their current seven meters into one meter. Uh, it's also gonna uh, require a new transformer and a utility meter, both some overhead and underground lines. Uh, but this will be at no cost to the district over time. It actually will save us some money uh, and we're recommending your approval. I'm available for any questions. Another question, Mr. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Is this uh, specifically, uh, there's no map or anything for the easement, but is this specifically for South Cobb uh, yes, High sir. School? Yes, sir. Okay. And it's replacing, it's upgrading uh, older transformers or? They, and, and Mr. Scamhorn, I will readily admit, if I recall, you're an engineer by training and may have an electrical engineering degree. I was a history major, so you're rapidly going to exhaust my knowledge okay, of this area. Okay, I'll be kind have, to you. Thank you. They have seven current meters, and they're going to replace that with one. That also is going to require a new transformer uh, and obviously a new meter to, to, to replace the seven with one and some rewiring. Okay. Uh, I won't ask you if those transformers are Delta or Y configured. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Thayer? Without objection, consent? That's thank good. you, sir. Agenda item number four, recommendation for approval of an intergovernmental agreement between Cobb County Board of Commissioners and the school district for roadway improvements along Faber Road at Osborne High School. You are familiar with this process. We've used it a number of times in the past when the Cobb County DOT is doing splossed work on roadway improvements at or near a school. We try to take that opportunity to piggyback along those uh, and do some improvements uh, at our school on our property as well. Obviously, uh, if they're doing work there and we can then piggyback on that and reimburse them for the cost uh, of adding that to their project, obviously contingent on our reimbursement, contingent on the work being done to our specs, it gives us economy of scale and makes the improvements that we pay for much cheaper than if we undertook them on our own. So that's a, a good use of uh, stakeholder resources. In this case, the county DOT has, as part of their SPLOS pro program, approved some improvements along Favor Road, and you see the map there, uh, 
they, they are going to be adding an in and out or improving and adding an in and out lane to the school really for the purpose of ingress and egress, some additional sidewalks as well. Uh, they are going to be doing approximately, they, the, the commissioners, $1.1 million of work and you see uh, the dollar amount there, the, our share, the $198,000 is specifically for driveway improvements into the school. So this will get us uh, a good result, and I don't have an exact amount of what that would cost us to do on our own, but it would be more than $198,000. And we have a great relationship with the, uh, the good folks at the Cobb DOT, so we're recommending that once again we be allowed to uh, execute this and piggyback upon the work they're doing. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Adams, looking at the uh, map, uh, is it just that is a two or three entrances nexus out of, out of Osborne? Well, looking at it, uh, it looks to me like there are three. If you count from Favor Road, you've got that first one on the left, the second one, and the third one there. Okay, the major one has got the divide to it, uh, or the big divide. Oh, the first one on the left has a divide. And the, and the one in the middle has a much longer, well, much wider divide, it looks like. Uh, do you know why they did not elect to put a lot there? No, sir, I don't, but we can inquire. Okay, because it seems like it would be appropriate uh, uh, with uh, the, that many entrances uh, that, and the traffic that's going to be generated three, two times, at least two times a day. Uh, you know, it, you know it, uh, it seems like a, a lot would be appropriate here, so. We can inquire. They do, as you know, an extensive amount of research on these, uh, and, and traffic engineering is a whole field unto itself, but we can check that out for you. Okay. And they would, if we did, if they did decide to put a lot there, they would pay for it? That, I believe so, because that would be on their, on their property, so to speak. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Ms. Thayer? Yeah, unless they significantly are planning to increase the parking there, which I don't think they are, I, I doubt they need one. But again, it doesn't hurt to check, but um, I'd recommend consent. I've, I've got a question, Mr. Adams. Yes, sir. In the uh, background, it says to the main school driveway at Osborne High School. What, what I'm seeing here is that that is where it is, is currently then. There isn't the um, Wendy Hill that isn't a main entrance way. You know, we, we purchased that property down there closer there. That is the entrance is still going to be up on Favor Road is what you're telling me. Well, this specific improvement is along Favor Road in the area indicated from Wendy Hill South. We do work with them uh, and they are aware of our plans for the property that we've purchased. Uh, so they're in the loop on that. But this particular item is for that stretch of favor. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Scamahorn? Yeah. <clears throat> Just glancing at it now <coughs> and before, I like it. It's double left-hand we turn on the, to the Windy Hill. And uh, good queuing to get into Osborne. So, and I think there's a, a crossing guard there on... Uh, that's called Kennedy Lane. There's always a crossing guard there. There's one on that road. I, I think yeah. you're correct, but there's definitely one on the road. Well, there's a light at Favor and Windy Hill. Uh, there may be a crossing guard there too, but I know there's one down there because I get stopped there. Uh, you know, when school's let out and I go by. So I do stop too, uh, Mr. Adams. I, we appreciate that. Okay, sir. thank you. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chair. Let me check that on camera. Ms. Thayer. Uh, Mr. Adams, I was assuming on this agenda item, this is just an improvement to the Favor Road entrance, but you remember at the community um, meeting that we had with Osborne that they were promised a, a, a major entrance on Windy Hill Road, so that's not being addressed at this time. This is just a another agenda item. That's not addressing that major entrance to the school. This is just a, a street improvement for Favor Road, yes, correct? Yes, and I agree with your recollection, and yes. I, I think you could probably see that at a later date, but yes. this is specific okay. to I just I just wanted to this. make that clear this yes, time that this is not, okay, thank you. Okay, 
If there's no objections, that's uh, consent. Uh, uh, just as yeah. a response, I don't think there were. All right, it's. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do. Whatever. You're voting on it tonight, so it doesn't matter. Whatever you want. Consent. If there are no objections, we're going to put it on a consent. There are no consent or no objections as a consent item. Objection. You're going to check now? I did object. Okay, excuse me. We'll put that for discussion. Thank you, Mr. Banks. All right, Mr. Didn't see you. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, what you have in front of your place uh, for agenda item number five is a recommendation for approval of the 2019 legislative priorities. Um, you will see, um, as we have discussed before, uh, on the front of the card, uh, there are three categories, uh, local control, financial sustainability, and accuracy and accountability. Just to run through uh, those um, for the benefit of, of those watching, uh, number one under local control is to maximize assessment flexibility, uh, maintain local control of school calendar process, and retain K-12 control of CTAE slash dual enrollment. Under financial stability, sustainability, uh, we wanna make local fair share fair. Um, that's uh, kind of a recurring um, item that we've had on legislative priorities uh, for many years now, seems like, uh, with no traction whatsoever gain, but we still maintain hope. Uh, and expand alternative resources and then uh, number three, under accuracy and accountability, um, this has gotten significant traction and hopefully we can still see this come to fruition uh, to produce graduation rates that more accurately reflect schools' academic progress and, and always the example I use is of Osborne High School. Uh, their current graduation rate is in the 60s. Um, when you take students that uh, are present at Osborne High School for all four years of their high school career, the graduation rate is in the 90s, um, quite the difference. And what we're trying to do is get the, the legislature to understand um, that there are some things, now some things are governed by federal uh, parameters, but there are some things as far as what can, is considered a, a four-year cohort uh, and what students make up that cohort, and that's what we're anticipating uh, to be discussed as part of this legislative priority. Now on the flip side of the card, uh, basically what we are providing is a glance into the school district. Um, there, there's a lot of stats and figures on here, but it's all of them are very important, uh, especially for our delegation uh, uh, from Cobb uh, to be familiar with. So we're, we're providing them with this data uh, on the same card as we're providing the legislative priority. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or in, engage in any discussion that, that we want to partake in uh, about the priorities. Questions, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the 111,983, is that the October count? Yes. Okay. All right, very good, thank you. Any other questions? Consent? Without objection? Consent. We put that on consent without objection. All right, then that'll be a discussion item as well. All right, Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Sherry Hill to come forward and bring agenda item number six. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, and Mr. Superintendent. I bring to you agenda item number six with a, re with a recommendation for approval to allocate funds for additional school allotments, if needed, to accommodate student growth in general education and special education for our students. And I'm up for any questions. Questions? Mr. Scammerhorn, Ms. Thayer, Ms. Banks, Mr. Sweeney. Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to go consent without objection again. Any objections? I, I'm not going to say that I have an objection, but I do want to raise a question here. Since it has to do with expending additional funds, 
wouldn't it be better to be on a discussion? Uh, I mean, it's, I mean that's generally what our precedence has been is to give the public a chance to to comment. I'm open for it. if somebody says I'm I'm off base, I, it's fine. But uh, well, let me just throw this out here. Generally, in the past, um, the reason for uh, as Mr. Banks has brought up earlier about SPLOS expenditures uh, being on discussion. The reason that has been the process is because when the F&T committee met once a month, the F&T committee met and we had two board meetings per month. The F&T committee met in the middle of the work session and the voting session. So the reason for having um, expenditures for uh, SPLOST in particular on the discussion agenda is to allow the F&T committee to discuss and initially recommend for approval. They did not approve anything uh, per se, but to recommend for approval those uh, items being discussed. Now that uh, the F&T meets once a quarter and we only have one board meeting per month, the, the discussion or the, the work session is this afternoon. The voting session is, starts tonight at seven. It's totally uh, the prerogative of the board of what you put on consent and discussion. Um, it, uh, because the F&T, again, is not discussing any SPLOST expenditure items, um, so it's just totally um, at, at the board's pleasure as to where you put discussion and, and consent items. Okay. Uh, just, uh, and it, I'm fine with consent, but just to be clear, it says the cost. Is that not to exceed two million dollars? And then, if you get there, you'll come back to the board. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. That's a great question, Mr. Gamahorn. Um, because the point to be made is, um, in the past, um, we have uh, we, being the combination of, of staff, executive cabinet, and the board, have come up with a number to be used for additional allotments if needed when the budget was was originally approved, um, and. We just didn't feel like that was the best practice um, for moving forward. So when we asked you to approve this budget uh, that we're currently in, the FY19 budget, um, we came up with the pool of allotments, as, as you'll recall, and we felt like that that pool was going to be sufficient to get us through the operation of the school year. And we said at that point in time, if not, then we would certainly come back to the board, which we're doing now. Um, the the two million dollars the the majority of these allotments will be used for special ed and you've heard me use the example when a special ed student shows up at our doorstep with an IEP that IEP is the law basically for that student so if it says if the IEP says uh, thou shalt have a one-on-one -on -one parapro um, then we have to provide a, a parapro for that student uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis we don't have an option um, to not do that so the preponderance of uh, these allotments will be used for special ed. 100% of the allotments will be used for um, classroom instruction. So either teachers, parapros, uh, or special ed um, teachers, parapros will be what the, the allotments are utilized for. And yes, to, to your specific question, up to $2 million. And if we reach that and we needed additional allotments, then we will come back to the board we do not anticipate that um, because, again, uh, we feel like this is the best practice um, moving forward uh, to to operate in this manner such that uh, there was just a little bit of gray area around, you know, how much do you ask for at the beginning of the budget? Um, you know, it, everything is just a guesstimate, um, and, and I quite honestly don't, don't like operating in, in that realm when we're talking about as much money as we're talking about. So thanks for that question. Appreciate Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have no objection. Thank you. Mr. Banks, you have a question? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, this $2 million will actually be absorbed in the FY20 budget, correct? So that it, if, it's if not, in fact, we use it all, yes. It, it's really not money we don't have. It's money that we do have, and it would be part of the budget because at the end of the year, we lose a lot of, we lose about five to 600 employees. So this will buy maybe 50 at the most. 
Uh, well, actually, if uh, doing the simple math, because I forget who asked me this, but I already had to do it, uh, using $90,000 for the average teacher, um, that's 22.22 uh, .22 positions. Okay. Off the top of my so head. So it's, it's not a deal breaker. Then. <laughs> exactly. Actually, 22.22222 to infinity, and I just said 22.22. .22. But yes, it's not a deal breaker. Uh, but um, to your point, these positions, if, if fully popped, uh, fully utilized, will then be absorbed into the general fund budget next year, which is why I had rather proceed in this manner versus getting a, a lump sum at the beginning that maybe is used, maybe not as used. It, it's just, it just makes for better financial stewardship moving forward. Well, I always question, do we allocate enough? But I'll, I'll take the two million. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Ms. Thayer? I was just thinking on um, Mr. Scammerhorn's line of thinking of whether it should be discussion or not. And I think uh, something for transparency's sake, if we were cutting teachers, I think it would be important that we leave it for discussion because that's a top, whether we had to or not, I think it's important that the public have a chance to think about it. But where we're adding teachers, the public should be delighted. So again, I, I think that might be a you know good rule of thumb too, whether we have to or not. But if we're doing something that could be something that the public might not like, then leave it open for, you know, for discussion at night, something. So thanks. Point well taken, thank you. Okay, if there are no objections, it'll be consent. Okay. Any objections? No, consent, 7-0. Thank, oh. Thank you. Next, we have approval of the agenda. If there's no objection, our agenda is approved. And I need a motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel, legal or land, Clem? I'll say all three. All three. Mr. Sweeney. I think Mr. Chair, make a recommendation that we adjourn to executive session to discuss land, legal, and personnel matters. Sec Ms. Thayer, all in favor? Are you in favor, Mr. Skimhorn? You are? <laughs> okay. Opposed? Uh, that approved is 7-0? 6-0. -0. Doing my math? And we are now adjourned, and we'll return at 7 o'clock. Thank you.